Good morning. My name is Dr. Heather Brown. I'm the Director of Grant Writing and Publications at the University of Missouri at Columbia. I'm very pleased to welcome you to the fourth annual Federal Research Update webinar. This event is sponsored by the University of Missouri Columbia, the National Association of College and University Business Officers, and the Florida High Tech Corridor Council, an economic development initiative of the State University System of Florida. We're so very happy that you could join us today. Um, we do have uh, Dr. Eric Rolfing with us here today. Um, he was very gracious to reschedule after um, we were unable to broadcast Monday and Tuesday because of Hurricane Sandy, and so thank you very much. We really appreciate that. For all of our listeners out there, if you have any technical problems or issues, um, go ahead and send an, an update or send an email to federalupdate at missouri.edu. Um, you can use that same email address if you have any questions that you'd like our presenter to answer. Again, that email is federalupdate at missouri.edu. And you can send your questions at any time. Um, we are having a little bit of a time lag on when the questions come into the email box. Um, so send them early. Again, federalupdate at missouri.edu. Um, finally, as we go through the webinar today, um, we do have listeners from across the country. So instead of using specific times, um, we're going to use phrases such as top of the hour and bottom of the hour to indicate when our next speaker is going to be beginning. Um, so I'm very pleased today to introduce to you Dr. Eric Rolfing. Uh, Dr. Rolfing is the Division Director of the Chemical Sciences, Geosciences, and Biosciences Division in the Office of Basic Energy Sciences, Office of Science, U.S. Department of Energy. He came to BES in 1997 and served as program manager for the Atomic, Molecular, and Optical Sciences program from 2000 to 2003, and as team leader for Fundamental Interactions from 2003 until October 2006 when he became division director. Eric, over to you. Thanks very much, Heather, and uh, it's, I'm delighted to be here this morning to give this update on the Department of Energy. Uh, as Heather plowed through my long title, uh, you can see it has a lot of science in it. People have said, your title has a lot of science in it. Yes, it does, uh, because I'm a scientist. So let me go over what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I am in the Office of Science, so I'll put a caveat in from the start that a lot of what I'll talk about are funding opportunities and things happening in the Office of Science, but I'm going to try to give you an overview for the entire Department of Energy which is a very complex and large agency, so I'll try to do the best I can with that. I'll talk about funding uh, overview and opportunities, and then I'm gonna transition to a segment on science and technology for innovation and clean energy, which has been a major emphasis in the department uh, in recent years, and finish with some other opportunities for getting involved. So let me start with the DOE overview. Um, Long-term strategic planning in the department is guided by two main documents at this point. The first is a 2011 strategic plan, uh, and the second is a quadrennial technology review, which was fairly recently completed, uh, one of several uh, technology reviews that the department will conduct, and these are both available online, as you can see on the screen. Uh, we have a big organization, so we have an organization chart. So I'm going to show you our organization chart. So uh, basically, under Secretary Chu, the department is organized in three main business lines. Uh, there's a line that's the weapons programs and national security, uh, and as I'll show you a little bit later, actually the bulk of the department's uh, budget authority resides in defense programs and uh, nuclear nonproliferation, etc. There's another line, which is the science line, which is highlighted here in green. As I said, I come from the Office of Science, so we have a tendency to highlight the Office of Science part. And the third part is of the department are really the energy technology offices. These include energy efficiency, renewable energy, fossil energy, nuclear energy, electricity delivery, energy reliability. And as a part of that is a relatively new construct uh, that began with Recovery Act funding in 2009. That's the Advanced Research Projects Energy uh, Agency Energy, or ARPA-E. And ARPA-E is generally considered to be as part of the energy technology line. Within the Office of Science, there are six program offices that do fund research. Basic Energy Sciences is the office that I'm in. Uh, there are the physics offices, high energy physics, nuclear physics, fusion, energy sciences. We have an advanced scientific computing research uh, uh, program office, a biological environmental research, 
And the SBIR STTR program in the department is actually managed through the Office of Science, so that's where the SBIR STTR program resides. Finally, we have a fairly modest program on workforce development for teachers and scientists, which I'll talk a little bit about. That's primarily uh, funding some educational activities through the Office of Science. So I want to spend a little bit of time on this side to talk about the continuum of research development and deployment that the department uh, sponsors. Uh, there are different ways of portraying this. This is a slide that we tend to use in the Office of Science. It's a little bit skewed toward the fundamental science side as opposed to the technology side. Other ways of doing this would be the technology readiness level scale, the TRL scale. Uh, but basically what this slide is trying to convey is that the department in the Office of Science here conducts basic research, we sometimes call that discovery research or use-inspired basic research. The goal of that research is new knowledge and understanding. We focus on phenomena and the ultimate metric as uh, measured by publications and scientific journals is generation of knowledge and increased understanding. In the applied programs, which include both the energy technology programs and the defense programs, and to an extent ARPA-E, the goals are different. They focus on practical targets, performance, milestone achievement. The objective really is to take new energy technologies to the point of commercial development and hopefully hand that off to the private sector. So that's kind of the spectrum of R&D that uh, the department engages in. Uh, I should say in my talk today, I'm going to talk about R&D in the department. I'm not going to talk about some other major programs, such as the Loan Guarantee Program made a lot of news lately, especially with Solyndra and other things. I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, I'm going to talk about primarily about the R&D uh, funding uh, programs. ARPA-E, drawn here in this kind of wedge-like thing, is, is really a new effort in the department to try to fill technology gaps, to look at white space, to look at things coming out of what the Office of Science funds and try to accelerate the transition of those uh, into technology. So here's a kind of 30,000 foot level uh, funding overview. Um, at the top, we start with the funding sources, uh, again for R&D, that's the Office of Science, RPE, or the applied programs. And then we talk about in the middle what kind of modalities or types of research we fund. We fund everything from small individual awards, those are single investigator awards at universities typically. Small group efforts, uh, Energy Frontier Research Centers is a good example of that. That can be knitting together groups at universities and DOE laboratories. We have large multidisciplinary groups, including the Bioenergy Research Center and Energy Innovation Hubs. Uh, we, especially in Office of Science, support some very large-scale scientific user facilities. And then on the more applied side, we, we support some large-scale demonstration projects at the pilot plant kind of scale. And the people we fund range from universities, uh, national laboratories, small businesses, including startups, and large corporations and utilities. So um, this is a view of the department by budget authority, which is always an interesting way to look at an agency. And so this breaks down the, the, the uh, DOE into the portions of uh, its activities by budget. So this part, weapons activities, environmental management, nuclear nonproliferation, naval reactors, all of that is under the business line in the department that's nuclear security. So we are the stewards of the nuclear weapons stockpile and this large chunk for environmental management is really uh, cleaning up the legacy of the Cold War. Um, here's the Office of Science and down here uh, are actually the energy technology offices. So, it's kind of important, it's kind of a useful uh, slide to look at. The energy technology offices really are not that large uh, as a part of the overall DOE budget. The largest one by far is energy efficiency and renewable energy. That's where you find uh, things like wind and solar and vehicle technologies. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the Office of Science now. As I said, that's my uh, organization, so I know that best. So the Office of Science, one of the things we do is research to underpin energy technologies. So we command a, uh, an arsenal of basic science capabilities, whether those are user facilities, national laboratories, university researchers, that really break down the scientific <coughs> barriers to new energy technologies. And we focus these uh, capabilities in recent years <coughs> on more critical national needs. Uh, some of the examples are the bioenergy research centers, which are really targeting advanced biofuels 
energy frontier research centers, which encompass a wide range of science relevant to energy technologies. We have a long time effort in the combustion research facility, the Joint Genome Institute. We have five nanoscience uh, centers, and we're part of the department's overall effort in energy innovation hubs. Uh, so here's the kind of high level uh, slide for the Office of Science. Uh, we support basic research. We are the largest uh, uh, federal supporter in the physical sciences in the federal uh, spectrum. Uh, that includes a lot of Nobel Prizes and whatnot. We support over 25,000 PhD students, uh, scientists, graduate students, undergraduates. Um, and importantly, as I said, we provide tools for 21st century science, the world's largest collection of scientific user facilities. That includes synchrotron light sources, neutron scattering sources, nanoscience centers, and we've hosted over 26,000 or so users uh, every year, and also advanced scientific computing. So uh, I think we all agree science is the basis of technology, underpins America's energy future. Um, science of the 20th century brought us to where we are, and today the Office of Science is trying to lay the foundations for energy technologies in the coming decades. Um, so we try to replenish basic research, and that's where the federal government, the Office of Science, I think plays a unique role. Uh, we're part of the Department of Energy, so I'll talk a little bit more about how we connect with the energy technology programs. And importantly, a highly trained workforce is required to invent the futures, and scientists, engineers, training is an important part of what we do. Having said that, I will talk a little bit later about our specific programs in education, which are not large, but on the other hand, we do support uh, the development of a highly trained workforce through our R&D investment. So let me segue to what's going to be probably a pretty dry part of the talk, and I apologize for that. These are funding opportunities, so I'm going to talk about the Office of Science funding opportunities. I'm going to talk about other DOE programs, and again, I'll issue my caveat that I'm not an expert in all of the funding opportunities across the department. So what you'll see are slides where I point you to resources where you can learn more about those. So the Office of Science uh, has an open solicitation that runs every year. It's a cross-cutting solicitation, covers all the programs in the Office of Science. Uh, it includes uh, uh, all of the uh, opportunities for new research as well as renewals for grants. Um, it's tied to the federal budget cycle, so typically it's kind of an annual process. Uh, submission uh, is through grants.gov, and uh, I show you the website there for the Office of Science uh, announcement in our Grants and Contracts office. Um, in addition to this open solicitation, we have specific funding opportunities, or FOAs, that are focused on topics, obviously, and we issue about 40 of those every year across the department. There are many, many more funding opportunities uh, that are issued in different ways, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So here's a shot of the Office of Science uh, Grants and Contracts website. Uh, you can easily find it by Google. Uh, at the top, uh, there's the annual solicitation. Uh, there's a lot of information on this website about how to apply. And then down the side, you'll see specialized funding opportunity announcements that are open. Uh, you can actually look at closed announcements, too, to get a reference on what has been going on in the past. Uh, in addition, in the Office of Science, we've worked uh, reasonably hard of late to improve our web presence and our website with more information. And each program office now in the Office of Science has a funding opportunities page on its website where you can go and find out uh, more specifically what the office is interested in. In addition, it's, sometimes we issue things called um, expressions of, uh, of interest that are part of the annual solicitation. They are not quite funding opportunities announcements. They are just saying we're interested in a particular topical area as part of our annual solicitation. And then they provide you a gateway for more information and what program managers to talk to about that. So here's a list. Uh, for the Office of Science with the websites uh, for each of the uh, offices in terms of their funding opportunities. Uh, and I won't go through that in detail, obviously. Let me say something about an important program that the Office of Science began with Recovery Act funding in 2009-2010. This is the Early Career Research Program. Uh, this is parallel in some ways to the NSF Career Research Program. 
Uh, it's to support individual research programs of outstanding scientists early in their careers, and we define that as being 10 years from their receipt of PhD um, uh, in disciplines supported by the Office of Science. Um, so again, eligibility within 10 years, tenure track academic assistant professors, or full-time DOE National Laboratory employees. So one of the differences in our program versus NSF is it's also meant to encompass early career scientists in the DOE laboratories. The average award size for grants is basically $150,000 per year for five years and a national lab awards because we're covering the full salary and benefits of the PhD scientist, the PI, it's $500,000 per year. Um, we're in the process of the FY13 uh, early career program. Uh, we're in the process of now uh, soliciting uh, full applications from pre-applications. But this is an annual process, uh, something that we run every year. Uh, this is, we've done it now three years. Uh, we're up to about a little over 200 awards uh, in the early career program. And it's really, while it's not as big as we would like it to be, it's, a, it's an important program and a lot of opportunities for early career scientists. I should say that also in my organization, it's allowed us to get a really good view of early career scientists, particularly in academia. And so some of those folks, even if they weren't successful in this program, which is extremely and excruciatingly competitive, I will say, uh, they've been able to tap into our core research programs through our annual solicitation and receive funding in that manner. So it's been a, it's been a good program in many ways. So just generally speaking, the Office of Science in legalese, we review, ba we review based on this uh, federal law, which is 10 CFR Part 605. It has the four major criteria for uh, merit review, scientific and technical merit, appropriateness of the proposed method, competency of the personnel, adequacy of proposed resources, and reasonableness and appropriateness of the proposed budget. In addition, especially for uh, topical FOAs, we can include other uh, review factors as appropriate. Generally speaking, we receive proposals and make award decisions within six months uh, and certainly no longer than 12 months from the date of receipt, which again goes back to the kind of annual cycle on the federal budget cycle. So now I'm going to switch gears and talk about something I'm less familiar with, so bear with me. I'm going to go through funding opportunities in some of the technology offices in the Department of Energy. So the first place I want to start is with unsolicited proposals generally for more technologically oriented uh, ideas. Those are run through uh, the National Energy Technology Laboratory, which is both a research enterprise and also uh, does procurement activities for the department. Uh, and generally speaking, unsolicited proposal is something that didn't come in under a funding opportunity announcement. I'll talk a little bit about those in the technology offices can be submitted by just about anyone. It's the proposer's initiative rather than a response to a solicitation. Uh, these are, in procurement language, uh, considered a non-competitive action. Um, the proposal document needs to persuade the DOE staff and other qualified members of the uh, S&T community who review it, that it's a worthwhile approach, et cetera. Um, the proposal must present objectives that show pertinence to the proposed work at DOE, rationale the approach, methods to be pursued, qualifications and level of funding. And again, the website at the bottom has more information about uh, submitting to the technology office's unsolicited proposals. In addition, the technology offices offer a variety of focused initiatives, uh, and I'm not going to go through all of those that are currently open at the, at the website here. You can see, uh, look up which uh, opportunities are open. This is the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. This is the largest of the technology offices. Um, the topical areas of interest in EERE, as we call it, include biomass or biofuels, building efficiencies, geothermal energy, fuel cells, advanced manufacturing technologies. That's where we have our large solar program. I'll say something about that. Vehicle technologies, which in recent years has meant a great deal of effort and emphasis on electrical vehicle technology. Uh, wind power and water, which is a cross-cutting theme. The Office of Nuclear Energy uh, has very modest university programs. In some of the next slides, I'm going to talk primarily about the university programs offered by some of our technology offices, because I think that's what this audience would be interested in. 
Uh, obviously, a large amount of that budget authority that I showed uh, earlier slide is directed at specific programs in the DOE National Laboratories. Uh, that's true for nuclear energy uh, in particular. But the Nuclear Energy University programs were created in 2009 to really consolidate what was kind of a fractionated university support. It's really objectives are cutting edge research, of course, but also a large portion of what they're interested in is really maintaining that uh, pipeline of trained profession, professionals in nuclear science and engineering uh, that include things like health physics, radiochemistry, and applied nuclear physics. We actually partner fairly extensively with nuclear energy in the Office of Nuclear Physics to keep this going. Uh, we have a program in heavy element actinide chemistry, which uh, is very important to the department's interests, but isn't uh, necessarily of great topical interest to universities. Um, the Office of Fossil Energy has a couple of programs worth mentioning. One is University Coal Research Program, uh, fundamental research that cuts across what the National Energy Technology Laboratories research programs are doing. Um, again, you, you can read that on the slide, sustain a university program in energy and environmental science, provide a future supply. Again, a lot of what the technology offices are interested in are making sure that there's an adequate pipeline of scientists and engineers in the area of technology that's interested to them. They also have an HBCU and Minority Serving Institutions program, which is described there. Um, Office of Electricity Delivery and Energy Reliability. Uh, again, uh, this is heavily focused these days on modernizing electricity grid, enhancing security thereby, and facilitating recovery from disruptions to energy supply. Always a topical focus following a hurricane and massive power outages. Uh, there'll be lots of things in the news about how horrible our grid system is. We all understand that and the department is uh, making strides at trying to improve uh, grid technologies for the future. Uh, so some of the priorities in uh, OE, uh, as we call it, uh, everything in the department has a two or three letter acronym. Um, our clean energy and transmission reliability, smart grid uh, developments, uh, energy storage, that's a major emphasis in the department. Energy storage in two ways. One is vehicles, and that's batteries for vehicles, but the other is large-scale grid storage. Uh, how do we store intermittent uh, renewable supplies of energy, wind or solar, uh, so we can use them when we need them? And then cybersecurity connected with energy delivery. Okay, let me spend a little bit of time on ARPA-E. Uh, ARPA-E was established in 2009 uh, with funding from the Recovery Act. Uh, ARPA-E is modeled uh, fairly closely after the DARPA model. Uh, their focus is on creative out-of-the-box transformations for energy research that, generally speaking, would be too risky for industry or perhaps our technology offices to invest in. Um, they utilize a, well, it's Dar ARPA like, it's really DARPA like organization that is flat, nimble, and sparse. It's the same kind of philosophy. They bring in program directors for a finite period of time. Um, they try to create a tool that will bridge the gap between basic energy research and development industrial innovation. So, ARPA E is engaged in two kinds of funding opportunities. Uh, there have been, when they first started with Recovery Act Fund, they had a broad and widely open FOA, and they just have finished another one of those funding opportunities where they considered very broadly input from the community on what the exciting new areas uh, to transition from science to energy technology might be. But in between those two, uh, so two wide uh, FOAs have been targeted opportunities, and the targeted opportunities generally speaking, are initiated with a workshop in which the ARPA-E folks work with us in the Office of Science and with the technology offices to define uh, a, a white space, a target of opportunity. Uh, there's a workshop held to engage the community and resulting from that <coughs> comes a funding opportunity announcement that's very targeted. So if you look on the ARPA-E website, you'll see programs that they've run that are Focus. They're focused on advanced biofuels, they're focused on uh, rare earth materials, uh, various things that have been the focal point as a result of these workshops. Um, in part because ARPA-E was born with Recovery Act funding, which was a one-time shot of uh, funding, uh, they don't have continuing awards. Their awards, which are contracts, typically are fully funded for the project period, 
and they end after that project period are not renewable. They can end earlier if satisfactory technical progress is not made. Um, NNSA, um, uh, remembering that budget chart, the weapons effort in the department coming back to the Atomic Energy Commission, which is the historical roots of the Department of Energy, is the largest part of what the department does. Needless to say, a large fraction of that is not open to uh, competitive processes through universities. But there is an important part uh, through the Stewardship Science Academic Alliances program that supports grants and cooperative agreements in areas vital <coughs> to NNSA's mission. <coughs> I need to water for a second here. So those areas of interest to the NNSA <coughs> are fairly straightforward, makes sense. Materials under extreme conditions, <coughs> low and high energy density, uh, physics and nuclear science, and again, radiochemistry. So there's, there's an area of overlap in radiochemistry where we have an interest in fundamental actinide chemistry, nuclear energy has an interest, and NNSA has an interest. And again, the objectives here are to maintain a vibrant scientific community in academia that supports NNSA's mission important uh, tasks. Um, they also have a Stewardship Science Graduate Fellowship Program. <clears throat> I will mention briefly at the end that the Office of Science has a, mod a modest graduate fellowship program as well. There are other offices that have graduate fellowship programs in the Office of Science, notably the uh, Computational Graduate Fellowship Program. So that's the uh, bare bones, dry stuff on <laughs> science and, and funding opportunities. Um, I hope I provided some information uh, to you that can be used as a resource. And I want to spend a little bit of time backing up and taking a look at the department and saying, you know, here's how we're trying to make this all work together, uh, how we're trying to develop science and technology for innovation and clean energy. So I'm going to start by saying that the department has increasingly looked at cross-cutting investments and coordination. Um, and that happens in a lot of different ways, and some, some of those are, are put on this slide. Uh, we formed a variety of technology teams that are working groups focused on specific technologies that cut across the R&D programs in the department. Typically, a working group will have members from the Office of Science, from ARPA-E, from the Energy Technology Offices. They coordinate R&D. Oftentimes, they help define R&D in new directions and strategic directions. The energy innovation hubs are a department-wide, secretarial-level initiative where we're trying to bring together large groups of focused science and engineers, scientists and engineers on challenging problems. And more often than not, those hubs have working groups to coordinate uh, what we're doing across departmental boundaries. As I said, ARPA-E forms ad hoc groups uh, to identify white spaces through these, uh, through these uh, workshops and whatnot. And then we have various other topical items of interest uh, where working group level uh, groups can be established. We have coordination across the department for how we uh, solicit and manage the energy innovation hubs. And one in particular I'll talk about a little bit is the Critical Materials Hub, uh, which has had one of these groups help define um, that funding opportunity announcement. So in the Office of Science, our current, uh, we have three major focal points for science that's needed for innov innovation and clean energy. Um, the first of those is materials and chemical processes by design. Uh, we believe we're poised now, based on the uh, work we've done on nanoscale science, to really have remarkable advances in uh, clean energy science and manufacturing in solar, electricity generation, battery and vehicle transportation, carbon capture use and sequestration. And it really is that design uh, aspect, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, that's uh, exciting. Again, a biosystems by design is related. It's the, really the development, the incredible advances in synthetic biology uh, that allow us now to manipulate uh, nature for the improvement of biofuels and bioproducts. And then underlying some of this design is the amazing capabilities in modeling and simulation that the Office of Science Leadership uh, computational facilities offer. So I'm going to spend a, a little bit of time talking about these. Um, part of what we're doing in materials and chemistry by design falls under the umbrella of the Materials Genome Initiative. 
This is a White House-led uh, initiative, multi-agency initiative led by the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, and it really is getting back at creating a new area of materials innovation that takes advantage of our current capabilities uh, to accelerate the time it takes to go from material discovery to material application in energy technologies. So the DOE role in that is uh, to build the software uh, and theory tools uh, that, uh, re re that are required for robust, accurate, and multi-scale simulation uh, in both size and temporal dimensions to validate the software and theory and then we have application-specific R&D, for example, in lightweight, high-strength alloys for automotive applications that are part of the energy technology offices. So the Office of Science role is really the underpinning uh, software and validation, uh, and then the technology offices uh, are more the direct applications in specific technology. And obviously our emphasis is on clean energy. So more detail on what we're doing in the Office of Science is really, uh, again, getting back to research to establish design rules to launch an era of predictive modeling uh, that really accelerates uh, materials uh, discovery and adaptation into technology. In many areas such as catalysis or battery uh, specific materials, we think we're poised to do that. Uh, both because of computational capabilities and because of our ability to rapidly characterize, synthesize using high throughput techniques often materials that we couldn't uh, access before. <clears throat> An important part of that is the world leading user facilities that, that we provide. <clears throat> so this example that's probably too, too small for you to look at is actually scouting out new battery, materi battery materials from first principle theory, theory validating that, fabricating them, and coming up with new materials that just we couldn't even dream of before. We don't know if these are going to work in batteries, but we're hopeful. Um, the other area I mentioned was biosystems by design. It's really, again, learning from biology, what are the design rules that really enable predictive design for natural and hybrid systems for clean energy production. Um, so it's discovery and synthetic redesign of plant and microbial systems that really lead to more specific advances in sustainable biofuels and bioproducts. And again, we're not just interested in biofuels, we're interested in all of the products that we can generate from biomass. So specific areas of emphasis there include the new synthetic biology methods, uh, genetic toolkits, uh, functional modules and platform organisms, integration of these, again, verify and validate computer-aided uh, design toolkits. So there's a strong similarity here in what we're doing on the biological side and the more physical material science side. And finally, as I said, uh, our <coughs> capabilities in advanced modeling and simulation uh, really underpin everything we're able to do. Uh, this slide shows examples of uh, two of the latest uh, supercomputer capabilities, one at Oak Ridge and one at Argonne National Laboratories. Uh, everything that we do uh, on those machines is peer-reviewed projects chosen to advance science uh, and strengthen industrial competitiveness. And you can see the list uh, for FY11 of some of the projects that were, uh, that were selected uh, that are looking at the entire range of uh, energy technologies um, and basic science to support that. Let me say a few words about a couple of major areas of emphasis in the department. Um, uh, electric vehicles, uh, as we call it now, the EV Everywhere Challenge, has a very aggressive goal, uh, which is to produce electric vehicles that are as affordable and convenient as what you now drive today. Uh, within the next 10 years. That's a very aggressive and challenging goal. Uh, to get to that goal, there's a lot of technology that's needed. Uh, and we're investing in R&D for advanced batteries, but not just batteries, that's an important part, but drivetrain technologies, making the vehicle more lightweight, fast charging technologies. And we're trying to, again, bring together the best and brightest and scientists and engineers to accomplish that. So, if you look at kind of where we are today versus where we need to be in batteries, we're still a long way from where we need to be. Uh, this shows some of the current battery technology in, in vehicles you can buy uh, if you have sufficient funding to buy a Tesla, which is a pretty high market vehicle. Um, 
but we have, we have issues with battery costs. The battery cost is currently too high. If we want to get to these, these targets are a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle with a 40 mile range, all electric vehicle with a 100 and 300 mile range. If we want to get to these targets, we really need to bring the cost of the battery down significantly. We need to bring its energy capacity up dramatically. And this status of charge window is basically how much of the battery charge you can effectively use. Right now, we're only using about half of that battery charge. We could use 90%. We'd be a lot more effective. So there are significant technology barriers ahead of us for this uh, EV Everywhere challenge. Similarly, the department has invested, and again, this is an example, I think, a good one, of how the technology teams across the department have worked together to establish a uh, redirection in the solar uh, technology program in the department, which has a catchy name now called SunShot. And the SunShot initiative is really aimed at driving the system cost for solar photovoltaics down. And this is not just about the technology, the photovoltaic material. This is about all of the costs associated, whether it's power electronics, uh, packaging, balance of system costs, all of that has to come down. And to be competitive, you get to something for the total system costs that's about a dollar per watt. And we're not there yet. We're up here. So uh, there's a significant amount of technology and integration of that technology that has to take place. Let me say a couple words about critical materials. Uh, critical materials um, is an important topic for the department and for the country. Uh, I think most of you are aware of the issue associated with rare earth materials generated by the Chinese uh, decision to uh, constrain the market. Um, that highlighted uh, the issue of critical materials, which has frankly been an ongoing uh, issue for decades and centuries. It just depends on what material you're looking at. So the DOE has an important role in that, especially with respect to critical materials for energy technologies. Rare earth materials in particular are essential components of batteries and magnets uh, whatnot. So we have a large uh, portfolio in that. The Office of Science and Basic Energy Sciences supports fundamental science in a variety of areas that are related to critical materials. Uh, as I said, RPE has 14 projects under a specific focused area that's rare earth alternatives in clean critical energy technologies. The bulk of that is looking at rare, rare earth optimization of rare earth materials and substitutions in, in magnet technologies primarily. Um, through its Office of Policy and International Affairs, the DOE has produced two critical material strategy, one in 2010 and updated in 2011. Uh, and then the Advanced Manufacturing Office is supporting an energy innovation hub for critical materials, uh, which was funded in the 2012 appropriation and which is now being uh, competed. So let me say a little bit about the DOE critical material strategy. Um, you know, it, it examined the roles of rare earths and other critical materials in energy technologies anticipated for a clean energy economy. So it wasn't looking at all technologies, but it was looking at the important ones for energy. So you can think magnets, batteries, solar, uh, lighting, et cetera. Uh, and it found, uh, no surprise, that there are supply channels uh, challenges in the rare earth metals, and those are listed here, that may affect clean energy technology and deployment in coming years. And as a result of that, the department and other stakeholders have scaled up work in the past few years uh, and trying to build up workforce capability, but also address specific uh, challenges in critical materials. And so, again, one example of that is the DOE coordination for the Energy Innovation Hub and critical materials. Again, DOE-wide team consisting of staff from Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, Office of Science, RPE, and, and Policy International, uh, held an open workshop to gain more input from the community in April 2012, drafted the funding opportunity announcement, which was published in May. Applications were received in August. We're currently under, undergoing merit review and award selection process. So the goal of that hub is, is challenging. It's to reduce or eliminate criticality for existing materials and prevent future criticality of materials that are essential to modern and emerging energy technologies. Again, the focus is on energy. And we placed an emphasis on trying to impact the entire life cycle of critical materials that includes um, you know, the design, uh, the processing, the manufacturing, the use, and ultimately the reuse and recycling of the materials. 
We didn't go quite as far as uh, uh, mineral discovery and resource development because that really falls outside of the purview of the Department of Energy. Okay, so I wanted to give a few examples rather than just have a lot of dry discussion and bullet points about technology coordination. I want to show you how it really works and where it really works. It's important to do it at headquarters. It's important that we're communicating at headquarters, but where it really happens is out in the field where people are doing the R&D. So here's an example of carbon capture and storage projects uh, funded by Office of Science, Basic Energy Sciences, RPE, and uh, Fossil Energy, one of our energy technology offices. So again, if you think about technology readiness level uh, on the side of basic research, we support fundamental separation science, subsurface geochemistry and geophysics. ARPA-E is trying to bridge the gap by supporting high risk, high reward concepts. Uh, and then Fossil is really taking that to the bench scale and accelerating towards commercialization. And in fact, uh, we foster communication among carbon capture uh, and sequestration scientists and engineers and oftentimes, and this is one example, we fund people who are at a given institution. In this case, they're at the University of California, Berkeley and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. So at that institution, we have an energy frontier research center that focuses on uh, these particular uh, types of organic frameworks called metal organic frameworks which are essentially been referred to in some popular literature as a tinker toy for chemists. You can build these frameworks and put metals in there. They have specific interesting properties, one of which is the ability to separate and capture gases. Um, and so we're involved in how we build and model and characterize those. ARPA-E is looking uh, heavily at high throughput uh, technology for fabrication and optimization of MOFs, especially to get them to industrial scale. And then Fossil Energy is actually looking at testing those under realistic flue, flue gas conditions for separation of CO2, CO2 from flue gas and power plants. So this is an example where uh, uh, integration actually happens uh, in the R&D uh, in the field. Uh, here's another example. This is one in combustion. Um, the Office of Science has for many years uh, have a combustion research facility located at Sandia National Labs in Livermore. Uh, their claim to fame is in two areas, primarily computational uh, modeling of combustion and advanced laser diagnostics applied to combustion. Uh, that combination has really radically changed how we model uh, chemistry uh, in, say, internal combustion engines. Uh, our colleagues in energy efficiency and renewable energy through the vehicle technology program uh, have invested in applying those. Here's an example of a laser diagnostic applied to a real diesel engine in the laboratory. And as a result of that uh, characterization and, and computational ability, uh, a company like Cummins, which builds diesel engines, is able to more rapidly simulate and design uh, a real engine, and this real red engine actually exists in this real red Dodge Ram pickup truck, which you can go buy. Uh, so that's an example of where investments in basic science have actually translated all the way to a commercial product. Some other examples where we haven't quite to the stage of commercialization, but we're getting there. This is an example, really a good example of nano-structured uh, chemistry and science. Uh, this is a case where most of the catal uh, catalysts for fuel cells, for hydrogen fuel cells, which you might use in a vehicle application, use a precious metal, namely platinum, which is not a scalable uh, way to achieve cost-effective uh, fuel cells. So in this research, investigators at Brookhaven looked at how to replace most of the platinum in these small clusters that do the catalysis with a less expensive, more abundant element, namely palladium. So they have this core shell structure where it's mostly palladium decorated by platinum on the outside. Uh, that turns out to be wonderful because you can actually tune the activity through that structure. It actually works in large scale tests uh, funded by our colleagues in energy efficiency and renewable energy. And that allowed Brookhaven to go off and sign a crater with uh, Toyota. And now this catalyst is being, pre there's a license for commercialization with this company that provides catalysts to Toyota and other car companies. Uh, and I think I have one more example, which is outside of my field, so I'll probably whiz through it. Um, this is superconductivity. Uh, we have a major emphasis in our material sciences uh, side of the house 
uh, on understanding the fundamentals of superconductivity uh, and determining how we can uh, grow nanostructures uh, that display high temperature superconductivity. The applied research and development has really turned into fabrication methods for basically how to turn those things into wires and now the wires are actually being used by American superconducting and superpower in applications uh, pr principally in New York and in Ohio. So again, an example where basic science has led to actual technology that's out uh, in commercial use. So I'm going to finish with some other opportunities to get involved. Um, First is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the department through the Office of Science has a modest effort in workforce development for teachers and scientists. Um, this is really to help ensure the UE and the nation have a sustained pipeline of highly skilled uh, S&T workers. I think that's a theme I've mentioned several times now. Um, it's, it's true. Uh, I have to say that one of the challenges the department faces in this regard is that the National Science Foundation, of course, has a large and highly successful graduate fellowship program. So one of the things we're trying to do in this is a specific graduate fellowship program, which I'll mention a little bit more. Um, so again, you can see the program goals. Uh, it, is, it is strongly connected. This program is strongly connected and highly leveraged with the DOE National Laboratories, which makes good sense. Uh, it's highly focused on the science and technology of interest of the department. Uh, so as I said, we have a graduate uh, a science fellowship. Uh, we offer uh, summer undergraduate laboratory internships and community college internships. Again, these programs are highly coordinated with the DOE laboratories. Um, we have teacher academies, visiting faculty program, again, that's faculty visiting national laboratories, and the, the, the main thing we do on the K through 12 side is the National Science Bowl. Uh, so here's a slide on the visiting faculty program. This is to support summer research opportunity at Dewey Labs for a faculty member and up to two students from college and universities that are historically under underrepresented. Um, and it's, uh, it's a purely collaborative effort. Uh, applications open October each year and the labs begin selections in February. Uh, the participating faculty and undergraduates receive a stipend, travel and housing allowance for the full 10-week experience. Uh, graduate students are expected to be supported by their home institution. Uh, so it's not a funding program per se, it's a visiting faculty program that supports the visit and more information can be found at that website. Um, National Science Bowl is a highly visible and important activity that began in 1991. It's a nationwide academic competition that tests students' knowledge in all areas of science. It's high school and middle school students. Um, it's a very big effort, 22,000 students from 1,500 school and 16,000 volunteers. I mentioned the Office of Science Graduate Fellowship. That began in 2009 with Recovery Act funding. It provides three-year fellowships totaling 50,500 annually. Uh, it's modeled more or less on the NSF program. Uh, it supports uh, tuition, stipend, and support for expenses. One of the important expenses there is the travel to a conference and a DOE user facilities. And one of the things we've tried to do, and we have done, is to have an annual meeting of the, um, uh, science, uh, the students supported by the Graduate Fellowship Program at one of our DOE laboratories. And this picture shows the 2010 cohort at the annual meeting at Argonne. So again, that, I would say that program has had some fits and starts. To be totally honest, our friends on the Hill aren't always that eager to support it. It's been kind of an uphill struggle. Uh, we hope to keep it viable, uh, but I would say its status at this point is kind of on hold. So finally, let me uh, finish with about some other thoughts and ideas of how to get involved. Um, uh, the most important thing I can say to all of you is read the core research, read the information on the websites. You'll have descriptions of our core, what we call our core research activities. There'll be uh, descriptions of other funding opportunity announcements. There's always contact information. Our program managers are always willing to talk to you and discuss research ideas. Um, we're always seeking reviewers. We review a lot of applications uh, and we're looking for people who uh, have expertise and want to become reviewers or participate in workshops. Uh, our scientific user facilities are an enormous resource that we provide to the nation. 
a uh, real opportunity to uh, advance your research there, and I encourage you to look at those. Uh, collaborating with principal investigators in DOE laboratories is uh, always uh, an attractive way to learn more about our programs. Of course, responding to open and topical solicitations. And then if you're really into that sort of thing, follow Federal Advisory Committee uh, meetings, which we post publicly as required by law. So I think that is all I had to say this morning. I thank you for your attention, and uh, I enjoyed it. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Rolfing. We're going to turn it open to questions now. If you have a question that you'd like Dr. Rolfing to answer, please email it to federalupdate at missouri.edu. Again, that email address is federalupdate at missouri.edu. We do have one question in. Um, what is the status on issuing electricity systems hub competition um, and its priority areas and timeline, if you know that? So the, the, the step back on there were eight energy innovation hubs first proposed in the FY 2010 budget cycle. There were three that were supported. There were fuels from sunlight, uh, nuclear uh, simulation, and energy efficient buildings. Uh, there were none uh, supported in the 12 appropriation and two, uh, in 11 appropriation and two and 12. One was critical materials, one was batteries and energy storage. The, the grid hub, as we affectionately call it, is still uh, high on our radar. It's proposed in the 13 budget, but as you may know, the 13 budget, we're now in a continuing resolution. We're waiting for the final appropriation, and so the department uh, cannot move forward with the solicitation until we have the final FY13 appropriation. If it's included in that, we will move as expeditiously as possible. One of the problems with late appropriations is they force us to do a very compressed uh, time schedule for the solicitation, which is very unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, again, if you have a question, please send it to federalupdate at missouri.edu. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, you encourage people to contact their program officers. Mm -hmm. um, will program officers actually read drafts if, of proposals if given enough time? Yeah, so if you look on our website, one of the things we strongly encourage, because we're a mission agency, unlike the NSF, we do not have to accept all full proposals that come in under our annual notice. Uh, and so, so our program managers assess those applications, and if they're not they're not a good fit to our programs, then we don't actually review them, and that's a, a waste of time for the investigator. So we strongly encourage investigators to first contact program managers, and then generally that will be followed up with submission of a brief white paper or pre-proposal that we then assess in our office for its suitability within our programs. If it is suitable, then we encourage the investigators to submit a full proposal. That way, we're not wasting the, the investigator's time, the reviewer's time, and whatnot. We're encouraging proposals that we know fit within our portfolio. So by all means, we do review pre-proposals and white papers. That's a part of our process, yes. Okay, and, so, and some of our FOAs specifically ask for mandatory pre-applications. Typically, they do. For example, graduate fellowship, the, the early career program has mandatory pre-applications which again are screened for responsiveness to the funding opportunity announcement primarily. Okay, thank you very much. Um, another question here. Are faculty allowed to include a request to support undergraduate research fellowship funds when applying to the early career research program? So I would encourage you to check specifically the funding opportunity announcement for the early career program. Um, I don't I don't believe there's a specific prohibition from that, but I would encourage you to check that solicitation. It's, it's, uh, I actually think that, that the folks running that are very careful, <laughs> and so they, it's probably included in there. If it's not included in the FOA, look at the frequently asked questions, which are building quite dramatically after three years. Okay, and, it, and if there's still not an answer, contact the program officer. Contact, I, in that case, I would contact the contact folks who are listed on the Office of Science Early Career Program because that's a kind of a mechanistic question rather than a technical program question. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, can you talk some more about um, what opportunities are available for small businesses to pursue grant opportunities? 
So um, I would say that the, the largest one of those would be the SBIR program. And the SBIR program, I didn't cover in detail, but if you look on our website and you can go to the SBIR program website, they have a, an annual solicitation process. Uh, and we work together with the technology offices to define, to define topical areas. This year we are piloting a program where we're working directly also with the DOE laboratories to highlight areas where there are opportunities for small businesses to interact with laboratories to take some of their intellectual property uh, that have been developed at the laboratories and attempt to commercialize it. So the, the program changes a little bit every year. Uh, I would encourage people to look at the website and, and if there are any questions, uh, you know, that, that also goes through a pre-application process and it involves people in the technology offices and the Office of Science helping out with the program, but the information is on the website. Okay. Um, another question that came in, um, how does one volunteer, volunteer to become a reviewer? What's needed? <laughs> well, you, you simply send your information to me or anyone else uh, in the Office of Science along with, you know, some information about your expertise or, you know, a, a link to your uh, homepage. Uh, and then we'll, we'll consider you, where, as I said, we're always interested in, uh, in having reviewers. And uh, so feel free to send an email to me. Thank you. Again, if you have a question for Dr. Rolfing, please send it to federalupdate at missouri.edu. Um, <clears throat> a couple questions here about uh, international collaboration. Um, are there any international priorities uh, in the research at the, uh, the Institute? Um, um, and do you promote international collaboration? So, so we do promote international collaboration, but if I, if I would take a step back and compare what we do with what NSF does, we don't have a large number of specific funding opportunities to promote international collaboration, unlike NSF, which has an office for international programs that provides funding specifically to promote those. So what we try to do is we try to encourage international collaboration between what we currently support, whether it's in the universities or the DOE laboratories, with what's going on in, uh, internationally. Um, one area where we coordinate very closely and we're keenly aware of what's going on are in major scientific user facilities. Clearly, major scientific user facilities are not only an asset to the nation, but internationally. And so we have people who are constantly using uh, facilities in Europe and in Japan and elsewhere, and we have people coming from uh, internationally to use our facilities. And so we have a lot of careful coordination on the facility side. But, but for better or worse, we don't have a large international program that provides specific funding opportunities for people to, to apply to. Okay, thank you. Again, if you have a question, please send it to federalupdate at missouri.edu. Um, just, just note it is not federal updates. Um, if you send it to federal updates at missouri.edu, it will bounce back to you. Um, again, federal update at missouri.edu. Um, yesterday we had quite a uh, sobering presentation on sequestration. Um, <laughs> can you tell us a, a little bit, and, and you may not be able to share information right now, but uh, are you having any discussions about how you will deal with this if it happens? So um, that's an interesting question that we get asked all the time. So, uh, you know, I, I think we are uh, certainly aware of the potential uh, fiscal cliff that's associated with sequestration. Um, th the actual mechanics of what will happen uh, remains to be seen. Uh, we are certainly always prepared for budget uncertainties. It's just been a fact of life. Uh, I think the sequestration is something that's maybe raised that visibility higher in the public's perception, which is, uh, you know, can be a good thing, uh, maybe a scary thing. Um, but we're always prepared uh, for contingencies in budget. And so, you know, right now we're on a six month continuing resolution, uh, which basically provides roughly half of the funding at a level that's flat with FY 2012. Uh, so that's kind of status quo and we're, we're doing just fine. But we are being very cautious in how we allocate funds. I don't think that uh, renewals of grants or continuations of grants will be impacted for the time being, but obviously we're cognizant of the fact that the final appropriation in 13 could be dramatically lower than uh, it was in 12. 
and we will do our best to buffer uh, the impact, but there's no, uh, no neglecting the impact on the scientific community. Um, with respect to grantees, uh, you know, we, those are very important to us, but uh, to be honest, the bigger and more draconian and dramatic impact is on the national laboratories. Because there, that means people losing their jobs. And so if we face a severe budget cut that comes late in the fiscal year, it will be a daunting challenge for the laboratories to cope with that. So I, honestly, I think they would be looking, they, 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 given the legalities of layoffs, they probably can't lay people off at a fast enough rate. Mm -hmm. uh, so if there was a draconian budget cut, I think we'd be looking at furloughs, we'd be looking at uh, shuttering uh, user facilities because they couldn't operate. And so that would have a tremendous ripple effect across the science and technology community. And, and, and a little bit of that damage goes a long way. You know, once you start furloughs and layoffs at the labs, then people aren't going to be attracted to those positions. We won't have, you know, it's, it's so yeah, we're, we're keenly aware of it. Um, I can't tell you exactly how we'll cope with it because we don't know what it's going to be at this point. Okay, thank you. Again, any last questions, please send them to federalupdate at missouri.edu. Um, do you have any thoughts on uh, the continuing uh, EFRC beyond current funding cycle, beyond the current funding yeah, cycle? Yeah, another good question. <laughs> okay, so the, um, I certainly have lots of thoughts, some of which I can tell you. Um, <laughs> no, I, I uh, seriously, the, the EFRCs are held in very high esteem in the department and I think outside the department. I think by any measure, uh, they've been a very successful program. I didn't include in this slide set the uh, global EFRC slide showing how many publications they produced, how many students and postdocs and faculty they support. Uh, they're, they're a major enterprise and we believe they've been enormously successful as they finish up their third year of, of support here. So FY14, that budget request is a critical budget request because that's when we seek funding to uh, renew the EFRC program. Um, as I'm sure you and the audience know, the EFRCs were funded in two ways initially. Uh, partly through our base uh, appropriation, which is $100 million a year in the Office of Basic Energy Sciences, and partly through Recovery Act funding. So there are currently 46 EFRCs in the portfolio. 30 of those are supported under base funding, and 16 were fully funded for the five-year award period under Recovery Act funding. If you translate what that takes to support a similar size portfolio in our base funding, it would be equivalent to about $155 million a year. So I cannot tell you what's in the FY14 budget request. We're early on in that process. The agencies are just now uh, have submitted their budget request to the Office of Management and Budget, and we're going through the process of iterating with OMB. We'll get uh, passed back later, and then the budget process will you know, carry on forward and the budget will become public in February, um, as usual. Um, so the first step in the department is to make sure that we have a strong uh, justification for the EFRCs and try to, uh, uh, frankly, uh, grab as much budget authority as we can for the EFRCs, and we're in the process of doing that. Of course, the next step is the appropriation and what happens with respect to that in, frankly, what is going to be a very, regardless of election results, are going to be a very tight budget climate. I think we all see that the budget climate will be very tight. Regardless of the funding level, there, we anticipate there will be a competition for EFRCs in fiscal 14. There has to be for renewing them, and we anticipate that will also include the opportunity for new EFRCs to come online. So regardless of what budget authority we have, we believe in the program, and uh, unless it's zeroed, which would be highly unfortunate, we will carry on with the program. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question, are universities expected to collaborate with national labs or industries when applying for DOE funds? No, not at all. Um, you know, it depends on the specific of the funding opportunity, but within the Office of Science, uh, there's no requirement or preconceived notion that you need to collaborate with DOE uh, laboratory scientists or industry. Uh, we have uh, in the Office of Science something on the order of 3,000 grants to uh, investigators and groups at universities. Some of those collaborate with labs and some of those don't. It's not a prerequisite. It just depends on your science and what you choose to do. 
you have a question, again, please send it to federalupdate at missouri.edu. Have a question here about getting uh, high school uh, students inspired by science. Mm -hmm. um, does DOE sponsor any sort of education funding that would support educational programs for high school students and teachers that would get them involved in uh, colleges and universities? So um, I think the answer to that is mostly not on, you know, on the K through 12 side, primarily what we're doing is the National Science Bowl, which, uh, you know, is inspirational at some level, maybe a little top heavy on that inspirational side, one could argue. Um, uh, we, and I'd have to check, um, the, the Office of Science Workforce Development for Teachers and Students used to have a, a program that got high school science teachers involved in the labs, but I'm not sure if that's still functioning anymore. I'd have to check on that. So the, 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 the straightforward answer is we don't do a whole lot. Again, to be honest, uh, our friends on the Hill believe that's, you know, Department of Education or NSF's mission. And so they tend not to look too kindly on a mission agency like DOE doing that, to be honest. Okay, so it might be a, a better place for folks to look at NSF and see what's available there. Yeah, it is. Uh, on the other hand, I would say that the, la you know, again, coming back to our laboratory uh, system, they do, you know, they do a lot of public outreach that inc includes K through 12 work. It, it just tends to be localized near that laboratory, right? It's not, it's not so much a national uh, opportunity. Okay. We have time for a couple of more questions. Uh, again, send those to federalupdate at missouri.edu. And just know that if um, we don't get to your question, we will make sure that your question gets to Dr. Rolfing directly. Um, have a question here. Um, are collaborations with NIST regarded similarly to partnerships with DOE National Labs? Um, so, uh, generally speaking, uh, we do uh, provide funding to other uh, laboratories in the federal system, um, what are affectionately referred to as FFRDCs in procurement language. Um, but typically, I would have to say those opportunities have to be unique. Uh, for example, where the uh, laboratory like NIST has a capability that we couldn't duplicate elsewhere in a university or in our DOE laboratory system. And that sounds a little parochial, but in fact, you know, each agency has its own appropriation line. And so if an agency really wants to move forward in a specific area, the best way for them to do that is to get that appropriation and to fund it. In the case of NIST, that would be through the commerce appropriation and foreign initiative that funded NIST scientists. Having said that, collaboration, you know, is always welcome. Again, it just depends on what the scientific focus is. The, the issue gets a little fuzzy when, you know, how much, if any, funding are we providing to the NIST scientist in the collaboration. If it's just a collaboration where the NIST scientist is funded and we're funding the other scientists, say, in academia to work with them, there's no issue with that. There's never an issue with that. And, and one area where in, in recent years we've had a lot of collaborations with NIST is in neutron scattering. They, they have a reactor, a neutron source, and in a time when we were building up our neutron scattering capabilities through the spallation neutron source and whatnot, NIST has been a, a fantastic resource for people that do neutron scattering. And a lot of RPIs use NIST for neutron scattering. Okay, so we're going to take our last question, and I know um, we're not, probably not going to get to every question today. We'll make sure those get to Dr. Rolfing. Um, but uh, the annual meeting takes place in Washington, D.C. Is there any possibility it might be held elsewhere in the country at some point in the future? Wh which annual meeting is that? A uh, person does not say. Annual meeting. Well, we have a lot of meetings, uh, so... Are, are most of them coordinated in D.C.? Uh, so, yeah, most of the meetings that we sponsor, uh, whether they're investigator meetings or our advisory committee meetings or whatnot, are in the D.C. area. Uh, but certainly workshops that we support and other meetings are not necessarily in the D.C. area. I, I will say uh, there has been a tendency to have uh, workshops and uh, investigator meetings in the D.C. area uh, in part because we have precious little in the way of travel funds. And so for our uh, federal program managers to attend these meetings, it really facilitates them to have them in the D.C. Okay. 
Well, I want to say thank you again to Dr. Rolfing, and um, if we have questions that come in after we're done here, we'll go ahead and make sure we get those to you, okay. and people may also contact you directly. Yep. And uh, again, thank you everyone. Our next speaker will be coming up at the top of the hour. Okay, thank you.